Welcome uh, to this presentation of uh, like a first part of a SCORP ecosystem. And today I want to tell you a little bit about profiling with SCORP and Cube. Yeah, my name is Bernd Moore. I work at the uh, Forschungszentrum Mühlich at the Uli Supercomputing Center. I've been there over 20 years now. <clears throat> I also work on, on tools for like yeah, my lifetime, basically my professional lifetime. I, I did it already with my PhD thesis back in the 80s. Uh, so I'm an old timer and I'm working in these parallel tools for a long, long time. Um, before uh, we go into the, the details of SCORPI and so on, uh, I uh, talked to Mark Andre and, and we both thought it might be useful for like a, a few minutes or really give you some basic terminology and methodology with performance tools. Unfortunately, different people in the community use these a little differently. And so I, I want to at least basically tell you basically what I think is the right way to use these uh, terms. And, and I agree with many uh, other people here and uh, yeah, and hopefully gives you some also some background uh, listening to the rest of the talks, uh, like mine and the rest of the talks. So when you do a performance uh, analysis, and uh, this can be done in two ways, you can do it analytically with modeling and so on, but you can do it also experimental by, by making uh, experiments. Yeah, so you, you run a code, uh, you measure it and, and um, analyze when the execution data. And, and this measurement is typically done in a cycle. So you, you start with instrumentation. Instrumentation means uh, through like either the user or typically automatically through some tools, extra code is inserted into your application code. It's, it's called probes or hooks. And this extra code is, is collecting the necessary information to do the performance analysis. And out of that, you get an instrumented code. So the next step is the actual measurement. So you run this uh, enhanced instrumented application code. And while running it, it does its usual calculation, yeah, to doing the climate uh, simulation or uh, crash test simulation or whatever. But in addition, through that extra code, it uh, collects data relevant for that performance analysis. And so at the end, uh, of that uh, run, you have uh, the measurement data, and then you look at it. Yeah, you you analyze them, and then with tool help, uh, metrics are calculated, uh, specific performance problems identified, uh, bottlenecks, uh, uh, and so on. And 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 this analysis and all the outcome of these uh, data analysis is then presented to the user. So there's a presentation phase. And that hopefully uh, the tool gives you a nice yeah, graphical or textual uh, uh, presentation of the data it collected. And by that, you can now understand how the code is behaving and how good or bad its thing is. And, and then based on that, so like if you found a problem, you would optimize the code. Um, but uh, it's uh, important to point out that basically all tools concentrate on the first four uh, items and that optimization then is left to the application developer because like every code is different, every system is different in different fields, different methods are used. And so it's, it's very hard to, I mean, you can give up some, some, some channel advice, but how that advice is, when really uh, taken care of in that code, uh, this is uh, it's like very specific and it's as at left of a user. So that, that that's the, the typical process, but uh, it's it's called a cycle, and and of course this uh, is important to point out. Once you did this change and hopefully uh, uh, optimize your program, you run it again. Yeah, and you never know. Yeah, you could your changes could have made it worse, or 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 uh, not as good as 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 pointed out, or the problem get moved uh, somewhere else. So you basically run a, uh, through that cycle again with your optimized version. Uh, yeah, and and you go through this circle until you run out of time, or hopefully at some point you're happy with the results and you have an optimized code. 
Okay. When we look at these performance measurements, uh, we can categorize them in different ways. And then there's two dimensions. One dimension is when a performance measurement is triggered. And the other one is how the performance data is recorded. So let's look at the, the first dimension. So we, when do we do a measurement when the code is running? This can come from like an external trigger uh, or asynchronous. Uh, so the typical uh, name here is use sampling. Sampling means there is an outside the program interrupt typically like from operating system, like a timer interrupt or a hardware counter overflow. Let's say like every millisecond, basically the program is interrupted and I, I take a measurement. Yeah, so independent what the program is doing, basically it's there's an outside uh, statistical kind of uh, uh, trigger to do that. That's one, one way of doing it. The other way is what I, uh, basically told you already a little bit about it. So you instrument the code. So every time something important in that code is happening. And so it typically it is things like a function is called, a message is sent, a, a synchronization is done, yeah, uh, a new thread is created, uh, stuff like this. At these points where something interesting is happening, basically we, we, we trigger the, the, the measurement. So this comes internal from the program. And as I said, it, it requires uh, code instrumentation. So that's, that's the difference. Basically, sampling is outside. Um, code instrumentation is, is a, from the inside. But independent of these two ways, when we do a measurement, we can do two different things. And one is called profile or profiling, which basically means every time um, a measurement is done, we we collect statistics. Yeah, so like we take, like we count how often basically something happened or how long it took, but we add it up basically. Yeah, and at the end you get a statistical sum summation of all these things that happened. Yeah, so basically what you lose is the the, the very specific values at all the, all the time. You only get the, the overall sum, average, um, uh, and so on. And the second one is trace, which basically means I'm keeping all these single data points uh, over time. And so I can also see how the data develops over time. Yeah, uh, some people think automatically sampling is profiling and so on, but this does, uh, as I said, it, this is not correct. So even with sample points, even if it's, you can basically record these sample points over time and then you get a sampling trace um, uh, and so on. So uh, I said, this uh, are the basic uh, methods when we do measurements. And here's some uh, details about uh, uh, profiling. As I said already, so we, we record aggregated information, like how long something is taking, how often it was uh, uh, done, yeah, like how, how often something was called, how many cache misses were there and so on. And we record that and we record that about specific program and system entities. So we typically do it like for every function in a program yeah, or every call site of a function or every loop. Yeah, they get a loop profile, a call site profile or a function profile. And because it's a parallel program, we do that on every process and thread. Yeah, um, and, and as I said, it's, it's just statistical information. So we get to believe uh, the sum of that values, but uh, sometimes also the min, max, uh, mean values and some other statistical information is recorded. So uh, the advantage of this profiling is that it works also for very long running programs. Yeah, like even if that program is running for hours, days or weeks, because we, we just add up that information. Yeah, so the, the amount of information is only determined by the number of items we are recording, yeah, like functions or call sites and the number of processes used, but uh, not um, uh, the, the, um, how long the program is running. So this is useful for very long running programs uh, to do some measurement here. The disadvantage is, uh, of course, I, I, I lose that variation over time. Yeah, it might not be important, but it could be. And as an example here, um, it's basically like, like, and you see on on the upper right, basically like every line, like a horizontal line, is is representing. Uh, 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 one processor and the different colors are indicating different functions which are called. And then you see basically there's 
this longer yellow block, but it changes uh, that different processors are executing longer. So if we we calculate like we add up a time how how much basically the processor spent uh, on the green function and on the yellow function when you add it up in this specific examples it looks like it's very balanced so every processor in the end executed the same amount of time on the yellow and green portions but as you saw basically it's it has an imbalance so sometimes it takes longer and, 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 and shorter, and that imbalance is kind of uh, lost because as I said, we, we average and, 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 and sum up. Yeah, and, and this can be only detected by, yeah, when we look at uh, the time series measurement by the tracing. The same thing is also, yeah, like you, you have something which, which changes over time, yeah? So like that green portion gets out of balance later and later. So we would capture that by, by the profiling, because like in this, you sum up the, the amount of green and yellow portions are, are different, but we wouldn't basically know that basically it got worse over time or, or it got better over time or something. So, uh, so profiling is nice, can get you quite far, but if you want to get really all the details, which are often necessary to find out why something is wrong, uh, you probably need uh, tracing. So that's, that's the other method. So what you do is basically as every time, yeah, like an external or internal trigger happens, we uh, record that, yeah. So like we record basically that enter or, uh, or a code region was entered or left, like function loop, but a message was received and so on. And when that happens, so we save uh, the data about it, we call that an event record. So what we typically record is when it, ha when it happened, it was the timestamp, where it happened, yeah, which processor, which process, which thread, and then what happened. Yeah, I entered a function, I sent a message, and any additional information which is necessary, yeah, like when a function was entered, which function was entered, when a message was sent, how many bytes were sent, to whom, uh, in which, which communicator. Yeah. And so then we get these kind of collection of these event records, and we, we, we can basically collect them in 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 time order yeah and so this stream of event recorders sorted by time and this is called when an event trace and by looking at this event trace is like a protocol or lock of what what happened we kind of know exactly basically what happened in my program at least on that level of uh, where i yeah i don't know exactly what happened on every instruction or something but i know what happened on that level of the uh, uh, events i define yeah on this function call and, and message level and i can reconstruct what was going on and i can also see when this processor did this what would the other do at the same time and, and stuff like this so it's it's really good because it can be used to reconstruct the dynamic behavior and the other uh, funny thing is we can actually still uh, get all the profile data because we have what happened, we have all the timestamps. And so the profile data can be calculated out of that trace. So if that's such a big advantage, why is not everyone using just tracing and forgets about profiling? <laughs> it's quite simple as you can imagine. Yeah, like if every time a function, function is called or I send a message, I, I write something down. And I do that for, for a longer time. Um, and I do that in a parallel program with many, many processes and threads. Like this data gets quickly out of hand. Yeah. So we talk here about gigabytes, terabytes, uh, petabytes of data. Yeah. So what you can do with it's typically you can only do it for like sh short durations. Yeah. Like, yeah, like do like one or two iterations of a, a larger program or on a smaller number of processes and threads. Yeah. And so typically, yeah, like you do profile to get an overview and only if the profile doesn't allow you to get the specifics and then you do a selected tracing of that uh, of that information you need more uh, more information on uh, to determine. This is how it's typically done. Uh, and so just like uh, to highlight basically how this event tracing is working. So cons like think about where it's like two processes yeah, one is executing code like a function foo, and then is sending a message to the other process B, and then the other one is executing function bar, and and uh, uh, it does this receive. Yeah, it's just like a symbolic example code, no real uh, uh, MPI code or so. So when we do this instrumentation, basically means yeah, like with the help of a tool or 
uh, the user does it, we add this extra call into it. Yeah, like it's typically at begin and end of accurate function. So we capture the function entry and exits and a message is sent and when it was received, we also record that. And when we, you execute that code, this is collected by a monitoring library. Uh, yeah, and then you do it typically on every process or a thread by itself. And each as that, like when something happens, you take the time, but in order to make that happen, of course, you have to make sure that uh, the time is synchronized, which can be complicated uh, and re might require extra work on like a large HPC cluster where the different nodes, the, the timers are not synchronized, uh, but the tools typically uh, help you do that and you don't have to do that as a user. And then basically on every, uh, basically processor, uh, you, you record that information. So, so you basically write, uh, let me actually get a uh, mouse pointer here. Yeah, so here um, you, you get like here on, on process A, you get this uh, trace. Yeah, and like each of these lines is an event record. So like at time 58, we entered a function um, and you don't basically write the long names here, but you make like a little simple table. So you say, okay, uh, function number one is foo and so on. And then in, in time 62, you send something to B, you exit number one and so on. And, and you do the same thing uh, on processor B. Yeah, so I entered a function. Uh, uh, again, function number one, this time is its bar. Yeah, so the, the simple tables, of course, can be different on the different processes depending in which order functions are uh, uh, executed. Then basically at the end of a measurement, yeah, you the, the first thing you have to do is kind of getting a global picture, which uh, means that we have to kind of uh, get a simple table of all the different functions and, and whatever uh, elements are in a parallel program. And we call this process unification, which basically gives you uh, yeah, like a, a synchronized um, and unified uh, global valid uh, uh, symbol table. And then uh, you take basically the, the traces and merge them together by time. Yeah. So basically you, you take these different records, make one stream out of it. You add one field, basically you say like, where did it come from? Yeah, and then of course you have to uh, adjust now the, the, the information now to refer to the simple table. Yeah, and, and based on that, then you can do the analysis. This is basically how event tracing is working. And, and the larger the system, yeah, uh, you can imagine the, the more complicated it's get to do this unification and merging uh, uh, of that data after that. So what do you do typically with this uh, event trace uh, data? So you, you do a timeline visualization. That's like, this is the example we had before. So you, you make a, a, a diagram and uh, time goes from left to right. And then basically you have a, a line for every uh, processor or thread uh, or node or whatever you are recording. Yeah, and then basically, yeah, it's like as these um, instruments in in um, in a hospital where you see like uh, like the lines, basically a heartbeat or whatever over time. Um, what we do here, uh, we're using actually color, and 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 the different colors are indicating what the process is doing at that specific time. Yeah, and so now, like you know, like everyone is in Maine, and so we make like a color uh, symbol table, like a, a legend. And, and then we know like on processor A from 58 to 64, uh, we entered a function number one, number function is, is foo, uh, foo gets the color red. So we make the line from 58 to 64 on that A red. And then basically on B from 60 to 69, it was in, in R, which is blue. So we make that kind of that portion blue. Yeah, and then you send a message which was sent from A to B uh, from 62 and was received 68. So we draw that uh, arrows, yeah, basically like here the message left at 62 and was received at 68. Uh, and then you do that basically for all the processors and the whole 
uh, time execution and when you basically get a really colorful picture which you can explore and but you see exactly basically what's going on which process at which time and and most programs are SPMD so they are basically executing more or less the same stuff at the same time so you would see typically normally stripes of same colors over time. And if that's basically out of balance, you, uh, this gives you some indication that uh, it's not so well synchronized or something is going wrong. But this is basically how it's typically is working. Okay. Um, I already kind of uh, 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 told you that, yeah, like there's profiling and tracing and there's sampling and so on. And, and it's like in, in many fields, yeah, like think about gardening, yeah, so like you can have a shovel, but if you want to prune a tree or um, do something else, uh, you typically need um, other tools as well, yeah. And it's the same here with, uh, um, with uh, parallel performance analysis, yeah, like there's a different tools, they have different uh, requirements, different features, different advantages and disadvantages. And, and unfortunately, yeah, like if you really want to uh, uh, work in that area, you have to learn about all these different tools when, when, when to use the tool in which situation and so on. And this is basically the, the background of this <coughs> seminar series. To hopefully that the different people tell you a bit a bit about their tools, what we, what they can do, what they can't do, and then at, in at the end you as as users uh, a little bit more knowledge and, and know how to combine the tools and, and use them in in, in uh, combination. But of course, yeah, this is HPC, high performance computing, yeah, like the, the programs can get, get large, the computers get, get large. At some point, yeah, like if you have like, then you just make a garden, but a whole like garden exhibition or something, you you, you need like bigger tools. But in that case, uh, you, you typically get experts helping you with that. And I, I wanna basically suggest the same here. Yeah, if, you run into a situation where uh, uh, it's get complicated, so you don't know how the tool can handle it or something. Uh, feel free to to contact the tool developers or the, the tool maintainers, and we are typically uh, trying to help people uh, doing more complicated analysis or specific situations and so on. So, like, don't don't be afraid to ask uh, for help. Yeah, and as I said, uh, it's. If you really want to do that professionally, you, you, a combination of all these methods, techniques, and, and tools are needed. Okay, so that basically was just the, as I said, the, uh, the, to give you some some background, and and hopefully it helps you better understand my uh, talk and and the others. So let's talk about this Scorp ecosystem. So Scorp is uh, a tool, and I'll tell you uh, some more details in a minute which basically helps to instrument an application and make measurements. Uh, it uses a component called Papi, which some of you might know, which is like a library developed in US by the University of Tennessee, which allows you to record hardware counters. And uh, Scorpi is, is like uh, uh, very flexible, so it can uh, do profiles and, and uh, it's, it's in a format called Cube4. Um, the profiles, or it can also, uh, if uh, desired, it can uh, do tracing and it writes uh, traces in the open trace format to uh, format. Okay, so what can you do with this profile um, tool? So there's a tool called Cube, which allows you to uh, look at this profile data uh, in a graphical way. Uh, and today, basically, in the rest of the uh, uh, the time, I will basically tell you about how to do measurement with Scorpi, uh, uh, like a profiling measurement and how to look at it with a cube uh, tool. Um, there's also uh, another tool called Tau uh, from Oregon, which will present it later in the series. Um, and it uh, has their own way of looking at data, but we are collaborating with them and they can also read our cube uh, files. So if you could basically uh, uh, use the tau measurement, but you can also do a score P measurement and then look at the data with the tau uh, presentation tools if you don't like our cube tool. Uh, another thing which uh, 
Yeah, but when you do uh, traces, uh, we can do a special automatic analysis with a Scalaska tool, which uh, generates an enhanced report, which you also then can look at the cube data and this is as a Scalaska. Uh, and this tool I will present uh, in the next, uh, next week. Finally, you, there's this uh, timeline visualization tool called Vampire, which allows you to basically look graphically as I just presented you this timeline, uh, uh, how these timelines are generated. Uh, this is this Vampire tool and this basically will present it uh, in two weeks. But that's not all. Basically, there's also uh, Tau has uh, a system called Perf Explorer, which is basically a database. It allows you to do uh, like multiple measurements, either tau measurements or cube measurements, and load the series of measurements into the database. And then you can do analysis over multiple experiments. Yeah, like this is useful if you would do scaling measurements, like you run it on, yeah, like two, four, six, eight, 16 processes, and you want to see basically how it develops over time. Yeah, and because like when we talk here about tau, cube, and vampire, you look at a single measurement at a time. And, and basically the, the, the Tau Perf Explorer uh, route allows you to uh, look over multiple experiment in time. And then there's another tool called Extra P, which is especially uh, there for modeling and investigating, uh, again, series uh, of measurements. So you would do multiple uh, uh, cube measurements, yeah, like on, on different number of processes, you would model it. And then extra P allows you to go beyond. Yeah, so you, you, you look basically how does it uh, behave on two, four, eight, sixteen, 16. And then it makes a projection basically how the the program would behave on 32, 64, and if you go on, yeah? And of course, the, 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 the more far the away you go from the measurement, the, the less uh, precise these predictions are. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a, a, a good tool basically uh, to like, like, what if, what if you go beyond, yeah? And so uh, I just told you like Scorpi and Cube, we do today, uh, Skalaska will be next week. Vampire in two weeks, and then Tau and uh, Extra P, as Mark Andre in the beginning already pointed out, will be uh, uh, presented in uh, later in October. But basically, just want to basically give you kind of a uh, big picture how these uh, things uh, fit together. Okay, so now basically let's look at Scorp. How can we do a profile measurement uh, with, uh, with Scorp? So SCORP, um, it's a very scalable performance measurement infrastructure for parallel codes. It's uh, a really uh, open source in the sense that uh, it's free download, uh, open source, uh, everyone can look at the code, but it's also a community developed. It's not just like one person or one group developing it, but it's like a, a, a collection of people who work on this for, for many years now, it's over 10 years now. And originally, uh, yeah, people had basically their own measurement systems, and but it, it's a lot of work to to make this work. So at some point, we got together. We got uh, also some support from the BMBF and other funding agencies to, to to basically combine our forces and then create one measurement system, which all the different uh, uh, analysis tools then. Uh, uh, can use. Yeah, so you find everything at uh, scorp.org. And uh, so this is a, a list of the people working on that code. It's, it's uh, Technische University in Dresden, my group at the Juli Forschungszentrum. Um, and then uh, there was the German Research School for Simulation Science, which was like an Aachen uh, Jülich corporation. This no longer exists, unfortunately. And then the uh, Aachen University, Technical University of Munich, and also the University of Oregon, where the Tau tool comes from, is participating. These two logos are larger because mainly now, basically, the main uh, maintenance is done by uh, uh, Dresden and Judic. Okay, so what basically can Scopy do? Yeah, it's the, the, the typical functionality that many uh, HPC performance tools need uh, in regard to instrumentation and measurement. So 
It provides various instrumentation methods to capture uh, program paradigms for multi-process, uh, yeah, like between nodes, like things like capturing MPI messages or uh, SHMEM messages. It uh, allows you to capture thread of parallel paradigms uh, and uh, here OpenMP and POSIX threads are supported. And also if people use accelerators um, and we can capture here OpenACC, CUDA, OpenCL and COCOS. Yeah, and of course, any combination of it. Yeah, so people can use MPI with POSIX threads uh, on every uh, rank and each POSIX rank is connected to some CUDA kernel and so on. And um, so once you instrumented that, uh, you can do uh, flexible measurements and you can, as I told you already, yeah, you can uh, generate advanced and basic profiles um, in the cube four format, or you can do event trace recording uh, through OTF2. Uh, uh, it's as it highly scalable, so we run that on hundreds of thousands of cores and threads to make sure this is working. So we use special parallel I/O to collect the data at the end, and so on. And and so as I said, it's the basis for like our Scalaska tool or a Vampir tool or extra P tool of the different partners. And so this is the different components um, in there. Yeah, so like on, on, on uh, you have what we call adapters. So we, as I said, we, we have adapters for the process level parallelism, for thread level parallelism, accelerator, but there's also, there's also adapters for capturing IO and memory behavior, POSIX IO, MPI IO, uh, like, uh, mallocs and freeze and so on if you want to capture like memory behavior and and then there's a way to instrument the source code uh, like so it can capture user functions and, and so on yeah and this is combined then with time and and hardware counter measurements and we can uh, support here poppy hardware counter measurements or uh, a perf uh, hardware counter interface but also our usage and, and additional plugins, uh, which allows us to collect uh, power measurements and so on. And you, and you said you can generate either OTF traces or cube profiles, and then these are used by the different tools. Yeah, so just uh, uh, to capture the, the basic stuff. Um, so how do we uh, instrument a, a typical power program? So first we want to know basically what is executing uh, from a user and um, the normal way of doing it is as we are recording basically uh, function calls. And we do this by recompiling the program with specific compiler switches um, and they allow us to insert this extra call code at the begin and end of every function. Um, Depending on on the on the program and on the compiler, of course, like uh, the typical default instrumentation that I said, I capture all non-inline functions uh, might be uh, uh, generating too much measurement overhead. Yeah, because people write like some people write very small little functions, and for every small little function, you do a lot of measurements, like the whole measurement. Uh, uh, Delays and 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 uh, uh, yeah creates overhead and, and and so what what you're recording might not be what you want so uh, Scopy allows you kind of to use filter specifications to filter out uh, specific functions like like not like tell it not to record specific functions because they're too small and then should be ignored and so on so this requires unfortunately some. Yeah, experimentation and 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 so doing that in an automatic way is hard. Um, so this is typically the most complicated portion of of using Score P, like making a measure in the beginning and kind of tune it that you record everything you need to do your analysis, but uh, do basically at at, at least as uh, as possible to uh, do not generate too much overhead. In the worst case, uh, you can uh, perfectly. Uh, uh, define yourself basically what should be uh, captured on the user level by, but that way you would have to basically use the source code and manually instrument and like put at all the functions and loops and regions you are interested in. You could put instrumentations point in there. Um, 
it's it's can sometimes worth if if you work on a program for a long time and, and you really want to optimize it, do it like in in this very specialized um, uh, manner. But as I said, normally the automatic instrumentation via compiler is is, is sufficient in in most ways. The MPI functions we are capturing by the, the PMPI interface. So the MPI has a standard from the beginning and it allows you basically to capture uh, uh, every function and we do that. So we intercept all MPI uh, 3.0 functions for now. And uh, once basically there's more implementations out there for MPI 4, we, we, we need to work on basically adding also support for MPI uh, 4 functions. OpenMP, OpenMP, we also can instrument and capture uh, in the beginning, OpenMP didn't have a standard uh, measurement interface. So what we did is, right, we wrote a special source code instrumenter called Opari, who basically scans through your source code, looks for OpenMP pragmas, and then inserts a measurement calls around it. This works quite well. But of course, uh, uh, depending how complicated you write your OpenMP and, and source code, it, 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 it can be fooled at some time. So it's, it's, it's not as easy. In the latest OpenMP standard, which basically came out, uh, I forget that it was last year or two years ago, uh, version five, uh, OpenMP finally now has also tools interface, it's called OMPT. Uh, no, not all implementations uh, support that fully, so, uh, but at some point when, when more compilers and more runtime systems support that, then of course uh, our tool and copy will be uh, reprogram to use this new OpenMPT interface. And then the other functions yeah, like CUDA uh, has a, a measurement interface called SCUPD, OpenACC also has an internal machine interface. So all these different uh, programming paradigms we need to kind of find out how to capture the necessary information. But this is kind of hidden uh, for you. So you don't, as a user, you don't have to take care of it other than kind of optimizing potentially the, 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 the which functions to record uh, on the user level. Oops, uh, wrong direction. <laughs> okay, so this is basically again in a graphical manner showing you the workflow. So you start with your application source code, uh, you run it through basically, uh, uh, when you compile and link it, you you do this additional instrumentation steps and you end up with an ex uh, instrumented executable, which basically you execute it. Yeah, and like these uh, stacked things uh, indicate here, this is multiple things like here means there's one instance running of your program on every thread and, and process. And of course yeah, it has the, the instrumented uh, application in it, in your code, when the actual measurement library and uh, when hardware counters also are measured by hardware counter library. And then if you do profiling, we get the summary profile out. And then uh, we can further manipulate that profile, yeah, like enhancing it with the right metrics and so on. Uh, so we get an enhanced profile and then we use uh, a profile browser to look at it. Yeah, and in our case, uh, oh, sorry. And uh, this is basically what I just said with this filtering. So when we look at the summary profile and if it indicates there's too much overhead and, and uh, the, the recording of the information is too detailed. So you typically do some filtering and optimized configuration, run it again, and you get some, some optimized uh, profile, which you of course can anal analysis like, like before. So in our case now, uh, yeah, like this kind of workflow is is uh, kind of tool independent. Every profiling tool is kind of working that way. But in our case, so like the instrumentation is done by SCORP and the measurement. As I said before, we're using the PAPI uh, library or the perf interface to record the hardware counter. The, the profiles are generated in cube four format and we use these cube tools and the cube browser uh, to look at the data. Okay, so now I uh, basically do make that a little bit, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, more clear. Is I, I thought I, I do just like a, a quick demo, basically how uh, how this looks like. 
So I'm I'm using a Jacobi solver, it's like a simple program which solves the Poisson uh, equation. Uh, but we basically uh, put it together. So we have uh, versions who is basically plain MPI, plain OpenMP, or a hybrid MPI and OpenMP, and we implement it in C, C++, or Fortran. And so uh, if you basically want to play around with that code yourself, you can download it here. Uh, uh, and uh, so let me switch now to, yeah, so um, here, I hope. Um, you still can read it. So here I'm in the Jacobi, I unpacked it. So yeah, it has a, like here the versions MPI, hybrid and OpenMP. Uh, let's use the most complicated version here, like the hybrid one. Um, uh, we have CC++ Fortran. I'm, I'm using the, the C version here. And then, yeah, it, it's, it's very simply as a main program, uh, a separate program where the Jacobi solver is in a simple make file. And so we can basically just compile that and we have to specify as usual uh, what the compiler is. So we have to specify the, like in my case, it's MPI CC. Uh, on your system, you have to basically know basically how the MPI co compiler is called. And in the C flags, we have to specify the, how to compile OpenMP. And yeah, I am using the GNU compiler. So the, the flag here is dash, dash F OpenMP. So we just compile it. So it, it compiles that program. Yeah, and now uh, we want to run it. So first we have to, uh, uh, say how many threads we want to use. So we set OMP num threads. So I just have a small laptop with four cores. So I'm just using two threads. And then I do an MPI, uh, MPI uh, exec on two processors uh, of that Jacobi tool. Uh, so it's basically runs two uh, MPI ranks and each has two threads. And then if you run it, yeah, you see it it's, uh, prints out some information. So it's works on a specific matrix size. Uh, um, and, and then it ran 100 iterations and the elapsed time is like uh, 4.12. Uh, uh, so let's write that down. So what you typically do is, so you uh, should record basically how long that execution is doing. Yeah, and if, if you, uh, like especially on a cluster, uh, you want to find out whether uh, basically the, the program is easily influenced by other programs running at the same time. Um, and so you run it uh, typically two or three times, uh, like in my case, because I'm the only one on a laptop, so there's no, no difference. Um, but it's, it's typically a good uh, idea to uh, like, uh, like run it and see how sensitive a program is running. And, and how much kind of system noise is, is influencing. Because like if you do, like if you, your run varies by five or 10%, um, it's, it's not very helpful if you later make an optimization and, and your program is sometimes 5% uh, faster, you don't know, does it come from the outside from the system noise influence or is it really optimization? So uh, uh, you have to be a little bit careful. So, but as I said here, we, it, it's simple. Okay, so now we can do the, the instrumentation. So we, uh, uh, we, we we start from scratch. So first we have to make the, the, the tool available. So we need um, access to the score P tool. So on many systems where it uses environment modules, you can do that by like mod, module load score P or something. If it's just installed on, uh, on a system in a specific, uh, uh, location, you have to make sure this is in your uh, execution path. So here in, on my system, it's called on opt local uh, score P7, uh, this is the latest version, and then the bin directory, and I add that to my path. Okay, yeah, and now basically, um, we can instrument the code, and this is done by basically uh, compile again, but uh, we prepend uh, the score P instrumentation command. So score P in front of every uh, 
comp compilation and linking command. And with makefiles, this is very simple. I just redefine uh, the compiler variable. Yeah, now instead of just compiling MPI, it, it runs it through the control at, under the P instrumenter, and then it automatically basically adds flags for doing the compiler instrumentation to link in the MPI wrappers, to run Opari, to do that, and it's all hidden from you. Yeah, And so now basically uh, we can just run it again, yeah, like before. And um, yeah, it runs like before. You, you don't see any difference because that, of course, this measurement is uh, the same. And now you see it's like a slightly, like before we had 5.12, uh, 4.12, 4.13 seconds. Now it's like 4.31. So it's uh, 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 one or two tenths of a second smaller, but this is in, 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 in the useful range. So I think um, the overhead here is not too high. I mean, it's a simple example, but if now suddenly your elapsed time is, is much, much, much longer, yeah, like takes twice as long or something, then uh, uh, you need to uh, make sure um, um, basically, um, uh, basically, we, we have to do something about potential filtering and so on. And you can do that with a special command called score p score. Uh, and then we want to use here the region switch. And then, oh yeah, I forgot <laughs> before going in. So like um, when we run that program, it generated uh, a directory and inside this directory, so it's always called like score P, uh, date and time and a unique number. And then inside this, uh, um, you you basically find some uh, configuration information and then this cube four file profile basically this is the profile measurement uh, we want to do yeah and if you want to get uh, like like if overhead would have been too high and we want to uh, find out basically what potential functions we could filter out or something we can do this by score p score uh, uh, and as I said, provide us region information by dash R, and then we uh, basically give it the, the profile. Yeah, and then uh, basically it, it tells you here uh, about um, basic information, and and if it would do tracing, how much uh, buffering for the tracing it would need, yeah, and how much uh, how the percentage of time. Yeah, you know, like in, in general for OpenMP, MPI, COM is user functions and post copy itself. Like as it here in that case, it, it's typically uh, everything is fine, but like uh, if there's too much overhead, you would probably see that in the, in the COM direction, this is the user functions, like that would be like a, a much larger percentage of time and, and the, the trace buffer requirements would be very high. And then you could look at the list of functions which of them get called like thousands of time or millions of time. Um, and then basically uh, like here in that case, uh, yeah, like the most, uh, 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 regions of code that use a lot is, is like the open MP and MPI. Uh, but in other uh, cases, um, it's typically different. Uh, you would see that. And then you could basically take that list of functions here, which are like, yeah, like executed very heavily and too often. And you can put that in a, in a filter specification and filter them out. But um, I don't want to go like here in this simple demonstration go so far. I just want to point out for like in a, in a, re in a real uh, large scale measurement, this is typically what you have to be done. To be done. Okay. So how can you, uh, as I said, uh, do now these different uh, measurements? So basically, yeah, like the measurement is just uh, done by executing the, the, the program as it is. And, uh, and we use environment variables um, basically to control basically the different modes of uh, uh, measurements. And there's a, a helper command called scorpi info. And if you provide it with uh, uh, parameter config vars, it gives you uh, 
a list basically of all the different um, environment variables basically you can set or unset or uh, to control the measurement. Yeah? So like uh, here uh, is uh, enable profiling, which is by default is true. So if you don't do anything, it's, it's uh, doing profiling, but there's also enable tracing, which is by default false. If you would set that variable to to true, then it would generate also uh, an ODF uh, 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 trace. Yeah, you can uh, get additional uh, um, measurement uh, information out by setting verbs to, to true. Uh, uh, you can basically change the name of the experiment directory, which is typically useful. Like to, if you do a lot of measurement, we, you could set it to the name of uh, the application you're measuring and the mode you're measuring and, and so on. And, and as I said, there's, there's many things you can set here. Uh, there's all the different ways uh, how to uh, uh, influence that program. Uh, there should be also, let's see, where is it? Uh, like here, uh, perf, uh, yeah, metric perf, basically here you can specify the metrics which are supposed to be measured with a perf measurement. And this, there's also one for, or Papi and so on. As I, and, and please look at the user documentation, uh, which explains basically all these uh, things. Okay, um, let's switch back to the presentation. In the slides, basically, uh, I, I made screen dumps of all the things I just presented. So if you wanna look uh, later, it, uh, can, you, can, you can kind of uh, uh, follow that again. Okay, I just uh, see, uh, sorry, but I just uh, found both. I see a question that um, someone is asking, how is support for newer programming languages say Julia Go Rust? Um, any plans to support those? Uh, assuming that automated instrumentation is available, are there options for manual instrumentation? Um, yeah, so this is, uh, the usual chicken and egg problem. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's a lot of work to support these stuff. So uh, uh, we typically uh, need like multiple people asking for it before we say, okay, it's worth basically supporting these. Uh, uh, just doing it for one user is probably not enough. And, and but once that not, it's not supported, uh, less people are using it. And so this has a usual chicken and egg problem. Um, as I said, the, you partially, if, if you know this language a little bit and we are supporting C function libraries, you could do manual instrumentation. So we have the, uh, for C and Fortran, we have a manual instrumentation API. And if you kind of can wrap them, so you can call them from Rust or Julia, you, this way you would be able to record uh, um, uh, also user functions in these, Things. And uh, I'm unfortunately don't know these languages well enough. So, but if they would use also MPI in the usual manner, so you link to not a special implementation, but the usual C implementation of, of MPI, you could also do the usual uh, MPI wrapping to capture uh, MPI information. Like for Python, uh, which is often a question is also asked, someone uh, basically did this and there's a, a GitLab. Uh, if you look for Scopy Python, you, you find it uh, easily as a, uh, uh, like a GitLab repository who someone wrote with uh, uh, wrapper functions for Python already. So you can even also uh, instrument uh, Python uh, code. Okay. Okay, so you, you, as I said, this was just a, a quick introduction, basically moving you through how to instrument and run the code and do the measurement. Uh, you might wanna basically, uh, uh, want probably not know more information. Um, in other, our trainings and also in the documentation, we, we use like a more complicated uh, example case. And, and what we do here is from the NAS parallel benchmarks, uh, we use the PTMZ uh, code 
And as I said, like in the slides, these are all links. And so once you have a slide, you can basically uh, follow these links. And so you can in the Scorpi documentation, but like the full workflow with all the commands and all the details are uh, provided. Uh, from time to time, we also do training um, in, in the VIHPS um, uh, organization and we do like a full week uh, tuning workshops and like here from the last one uh, the 40th one which was done in in in, uh, in munich uh, here's basically uh, additional slide sets which basically show you how to do the copy instrumentation and measurement the scoring and the measurement filtering uh, with basically this btm set so if you want to basically uh, play around with it, uh, there's uh, like uh, lots of information and slides how to do that. Of course, there's lots of also um, advanced things which we don't have the time to talk to, uh, about today, you know, like how to use Corpy with CMake, which works a little bit differently with, with the normal make files. Uh, how do I can uh, measure uh, calls to third party libraries like BLAS or uh, uh, other like mathematical libraries or something, how I can analyze application memory usage, how uh, the whole thing works with CUDA, OpenCell, OpenACC, and, and more instrumentation about the hardware perma counter measurements and, and, and details about this user instrumentation API. I, as I said, I, I'm happy to answer questions at the end, but uh, it, more or less basically, um, uh, please basically look at the documentation and, and the advanced training material here. Okay, uh, that was basically uh, what I wanted to tell, tell you at least today about uh, uh, how to make profile measurements with Scorpi. Next week, when we talk about tracing and Skalaska, I, I will come back to that and basically tell you more about uh, tracing with uh, Scorpi. Now, basically, uh, in the rest of the time, I went basically said, now we have this, this profile measurements and, and basically how to analyze that. And this, there's a tool called Cube. Um, so um, again, basically, uh, looking back at our workflow, yeah, like we instrument the code, we run it, we potentially optimize it, we get an optimized uh, Cube. And now we basically, uh, We look basically how um, yeah, we look at how this cube browser is working and how you can basically look at the data which we just measured. Yeah. So uh, where does the name come from? Uh, this is actually has a very specific region because when we we do the measurements, we we do it uh, in three dimensions. Yeah. We 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 collect different metrics. Yeah. We we basically we calculate how much how long something's taking the time, how often something was called specific hardware counters and so on. So we have specific metrics and we do this for every call path in Scorpi. So we get a, a, a call path profile and we do it on, on various locations in the systems, typically for every MPI process and every uh, thread, POSIX or OpenP thread and for every stream uh, on an accelerator. So, and you get this three dimensional uh, uh, structure that basically, yeah, like, a, I'm going to get that laser pointer again. Yeah, basically, when you 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 look at a specific point in that cube, it basically tells you uh, like what what the value of that metric for this call path on that thread or location. Yeah, and so it's 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 uh, uh, three dimensional, so it's called cube. But they are also hierarchical. Yeah, so the call tree by it. Yeah, by uh, is a. Uh, a hierarchy, yeah, you have a main function calling, other functions calling more functions and so on. So you, you can get deeper and deeper in a tree. The system uh, location is also, yeah, the machine has multiple nodes. On each node, you have multiple process running and a process has multiple threads and, and, and streams. Again, you have this hierarchy and also to the metrics we organize um, in, 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 in a, in a yeah, uh, hierarchy to general to specific. Yeah, and so in order to basically look at these in a, in a scalable and, and easy way, what we do basically we provide you with a tool which has a, a tree browser. Yeah, and basically a, a, a tree which you can uh, open and close and look at the data, and 
they are three of them. One for the metrics, one for the call paths, and one for the uh, system location. And they are kind of uh, connected and uh, you will see it in a minute. And so this allows you kind of to nav navigate basically here through these cube and look at planes and, and values and, and so on. And um, it basically works like this. So you, you have like here, look at a, like a call tree. So in the beginning we have main and 100% um, of the time basically is, is uh, spent in the main function, of course. Yeah, like if, if I look at the total program, all of it, all of uh, whatever counters or time, uh, and you, this is a percentage is at the main function. So this is typically how a line in these trees are, are shown. So there is basically the, the name of a node, the, the metric value, and, and then um, we also use a color coding to kind of basically uh, easily allow you to, to find uh, high values. Yeah? So there's a, a, a color um, a legend basically from the more green and blue, the lower the values, the more orange and red, the higher the values, you, you, you quickly can find uh, the higher values. And then if the, the node is uh, collapsed, as I said, it, it shows the, the inclusive uh, value so inclusive exclusive you probably know yeah like you have a function and then the exclusive time is how much time do i spend in that function including all the the, the calls uh, which are called from it but if i open it up so i i can kind of click here and then but, but it opens up and then it basically shows oh yeah main calls foo and bar and then basically it shows yeah, how much time it spends in foo and bar. Uh, but of course, uh, there's some leftover code, which was just executed main without the foo and bar code. And this is called the in, in uh, exclusive value. And then it's shown here. So basically the, the number shown in that tree depends there. Yeah, if it's um, collapsed, it shows you the... Uh, inclusive value if it's opened it shows you the exclusive value yeah this is just to uh, as a reminder basically when i later do the demonstration now on the tool basically how it looks like yeah so the the, the tool is is i call it always is like simple as one to three because it just has one window it has two commands and it has these three panes showing you the, the, the three trees yeah and what are the two commands yeah, so basically one thing you can do, you yeah, by clicking on this little thing in front of a node, you can expand and collapse a tree node, which basically allows you to choose the level of, of detail, yeah, like how, how detailed the metric is or how deep in the call tree or how deep in the system tree. Yeah, and, and then uh, for large trees, of course, we have additional uh, helper context menus to expand and collapse whole trees or subtrees. You don't have to click on it basically every single node. Oh, and then the second operation you can do is selecting a node. And when you select a node, basically it shows the distribution of that value to the next tree on the right. And, and uh, you will basically uh, understand it very quickly once I, I do the demo. Yeah, uh, for the demo, I'm, I'm actually showing like a, a real measurement by just looking at this little uh, 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 hybrid uh, Jacobi example doesn't show as much. So what I did, it's it's uh, a tea leaf, which is like a, uh, uh, it's 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 an open source kind of benchmark code. It also shows shows some some uh, linear two D heat conduction equation, um, and I run run that on our one of our clusters we have in ULIC, and uh, so. Uh, I run it on two nodes um, and then uh, I distributed like 32 MPI ranks over these two nodes and each uh, ran eight, eight open P threads. If you, I make the, the file, basically the measurement file, the profile also available. So if you like yeah, at some come around the system with a cube tool, you can basically browse uh, yourself and play around with it uh, as an example. Okay, so let's uh, again go to uh, the demo. Okay, yeah, so um, here I, I made this measurement. And so here we have this profile file um, in, in a, either you can, as I said, call cube profile.x or if you have a, a graphical browser, 
like I have here on the windows, you just double click on it. And this is basically how it comes up. Uh, it, so here on the left side, you have uh, the metric tree. So as I told you, we are measuring how often something was done. We call visits, how long something took. This is the time. And then a few other things, yeah, like here we, uh, instructions and, and cycles for Papi were measured. And, and also uh, it uh, does uh, for like uh, messages in MPI, it kind of calculates how many bytes per send and received. Yeah? In, the, in, the, in the middle, you see basically the, the source code. So as I normally it would come out like this. And so I can open it up and when you say, okay, like this, program called Steeleaf, uh, which first does these four functions, um, uh, you know, like a, a loop, then a function analyze, uh, diffuse. And here you see already, so let's, let's click on time. So when I click on time here, so it's in, in total, the program was doing 2,593 seconds. And by clicking on it, I can now see how this time is distributed over my source code. And I see very quickly, also by looking at the, the colors, yeah, on the bottom is the color code. The more red it is, the higher the value, the higher the values you see quickly here. Yeah, like this node, the, the diffuse is, is red. So we see yeah, like, so it's 2,491 seconds out of these 2,593 is, is, is done here. Yeah, and uh, so basically, it, it's it's not worth looking at the other code here because here is uh, what the most time spent, and here we might want to look where uh, something goes wrong. So we can up and look basically what's happening inside in here. So we said, okay, this seems to be some time uh, step loop, and inside this time step they call the tea leaf function, which takes the most time. And then when you look that up, and again, it, it is an, an update halo uh, uh, and so on, and then it does here. Um, Let's move that a little bit to the right. So it it's it does uh, solving of the CG in, in, in three directions. And when we open that up, uh, so we find uh, parallel loops here. Yeah, and so we quickly see uh, yeah, that uh, a lot of the time here is spent basically here in this OpenMP uh, loops. Yeah? And so basically by, yeah, by, so this is the time, but we, when we look at visits, we can see basically where are the most number of functions called. So here actually this update halo function is called the most time, uh, uh, where in time, basically the most time is spent basically here in these uh, uh, three uh, functions down here. Yeah, and, and this one, this one, and this one, yeah, okay. Yeah, and now basically, uh, so let's see, we have a time and we know basically here's the most time and how it's distributed. Now we want to basically see, is there a difference on, on, the, on the system? Yeah, so again, we select it here. Uh, we can select multiple of them by using uh, control select. And then we see basically yeah, like, uh, this is basically how long it took on the, on the full machine so that, number should be the sum of these three numbers here. And then we can see how it's basically uh, split on, on, on nodes. So we see it's roughly the same on each node. And when we um, uh, basically do it on uh, open up the nodes, you see uh, yeah, like how, how the different MPI ranks and you see uh, it's, it's roughly around 58, 56. And then if I open up the the MPIs, I would be, I see basically the values, how much time is spent on the different threads. And you see it's slightly different um, differences here. So like on rank zero, the threads take a little bit longer than here uh, on, on MPI rank one. Of course, uh, especially like, like in this case where, yeah, let's, uh, when I can here give a context menu, expand collapse, expand all. So you see basically this is basically a list of all the threads. And then of course it, it's not very uh, simple to uh, overlook that. So we also provide like a graphical way. So you can go here on the right side, there's a, a, a thing called topologies. And then this is process times thread. And so, uh, 
So this is basically process goes like this way and threads goes like this way. Yeah, we have 32 processes and we have uh, eight threads each and we see kind of yeah, by the color, it's, it's more or less the same. Uh, but of course, the, the values get all small and, and equal. Uh, so sometimes it's, it's harder to see the difference. So we have different display modes. Uh, and so uh, above the trees, you see here, like here's a line and here and here. So for each of the trees, I can change kind of uh, uh, what kind of values are shown. And, and especially on the left one, uh, there is a, a beer distribution uh, uh, display. So what it does, it basically, it, it uses the full range of uh, colors to show the differences. Yeah. And, and basically the, the highest values now uh, uh, are shown in red and the lowest in, in, in blue. Yeah. And so we see, yeah, that the, the highest uh, time um, is typically done by the master thread because it uses more time than the other uh, slave threads. And then there's this one specific uh, rank or like also like here, uh, like there's with dark blue ones and there's a few light blue ones. Um, so like I can click on here and I get this information uh, by right click. Yeah, so this is process 18 thread one or something where I said it has very low value. So I can, by, by looking at this graphical distribution, I can kind of uh, look at the differences. Um, another way which is kind of useful is not by looking at absolute numbers, but for the percentages. So I can change here, say here, um, uh, 100 percent yeah and then of course like like yeah 100 percent of uh, time and then here i can say a metric root percent which basically means if i look at the time so this this 100 percent is distributed like this way so now 31.4 percent of the time i i'm in that uh 50.8 i'm in in that uh this one and in 14.8 percent of the time I'm, I'm here so basically by by uh if you are don't want to look at the, the very high numbers but more like a percentage uh, you can uh, do this by changing it a percentage Okay, when you um, followed me, so oh yeah, like one other thing uh, you can do here by looking, um, like if you have very uh, uh, large uh, uh, systems, like with many process and threads, instead of looking at the uh, at the, basically at the, at the list, you can also switch here, but going back to system view to statistics, and then we provide uh, box plots and, and violin plots, which shows you a distribution basically of the values uh, uh, of the different threads and then processes. Yeah. And uh, which also gives you some indication, yeah, how, how the distribution of the values over the threads and, and, and ranks is. Okay, so these are the most important uh, things, basically, you know, like uh, yeah, opening and closing to look at deeper uh, levels, yeah, or in the system tree on, yeah, like just on the node level or on the uh, rank level or here on different levels of call tree. Um, and then by selecting something, you see the distribution on the next level, which allows you to uh, uh, like make sense of the data and so on. But if you uh, were listening carefully, I was talking that uh, there was would be also a hierarchy on the left side, um, which of course it's just a, a flat list, and this comes to the fact by default basically this is the, the raw profile data, and um, as I explained to you, there's additional uh, uh, tools we have, and like one tool is is uh, we call the remapper. Basically, you run it over and it generates additional uh, derived metrics and, and also kind of makes this uh, uh, metric hierarchy more hierarchical and useful. Um, I ex basically, how this is working, I explain uh, next week. Uh, but basically, the outcome of it, you get like a, a, another, re another uh, file. This is called uh, in summary. And, and we look um, at, at, at this one now. It's basically... Uh, like the same thing, yeah. Um, 
you have uh, as before. Just now, basically, we can also open up like uh, like here uh, with the uh, with time metric. Yeah, so the, the total time kind of splits up into execution time, overhead, and idle threads. Yeah, like how much of the time basically was uh, actually executing, how much time was overhead in uh, from the measurement in that time we had very little, and and then here also uh, it also calculates how much time we're spending uh, where the threads were idle. Yeah, and uh, assuming basically, yeah, you have the cluster by itself, and we assume we want to use it fully. We basically measure, like, say, 100% is yeah, the full time on all threads. And then we can find out on which portions uh, threads were idle because you were just in the master thread or just executing, like, a, a, yeah, sequentially. And we can calculate the time uh, which were the threads were idle. And you see here, actually, in, in this measurement now, uh, uh, compared to a, a raw profile, that this is very helpful. Yeah, let's switch to the uh, percentage. So like 53% of the program was actually executing, but 46% threads were idle. So it's, it's, it's not very uh, uh, um, uh, efficient. Yeah, like if half of the time your cores were just sitting around, and it's the usual problem. You have an MPI OpenMP hybrid call, so at some point you just master, and especially if the MPI functions are just called in the in a master thread, when all the other threads at the same time do uh, nothing, um, then you you get these like uh, idle stuff. And um, now we can quickly find out basically where uh, these things were idle. Uh, by basically is it, uh, uh, selecting it and then look at the, at the call tree again. And we see now basically how these idle threads is distributed. So basically where in the program, uh, when the program was executing what portion it, it was idle. Yeah, and again, it was in the, the orange here. So it's in the diffuse call, in the tea leaf function, and now we see, okay, it's here in the update halo and in the T sum. So if we open that up, yeah, we see that there's a exchange and then there's a wait all here. Um, and in, in the D, there's an all reduce. Yeah, and these are like this all reduce. Uh, let's again switch here to the um, metric selection percent. So, out of these uh, 46, 19% uh, basically was happening here while this all reduce was happening inside D all sum and the other threads were empty. And then the other one uh, was uh, here, where the weight all was another 13%. Yeah, so by doing that, we can quickly find portions of a program where like the the parallelization didn't work out as well. It could be not just could be a, not just MPI functions, but other functions where the, the user uh, had not parallelized that that section. And so, but if you want to basically improve that, we have to look at the T exchange function and at the the all sum function whether we kind of can overlap with sending with calculation or or, or do things like this. Yeah. Um, when we go to the actual execution time again, like before, um, like where is the most execution time? This is the, these three functions, as I explained before. But now we can kind of open it up and you can basically say how much of that execution time was actually cal uh, uh, computation. So we see where most of the computation is happening. And this was 43%, when 4% was MPI and 5% and was OpenMP overhead. Yeah? And again, we can say like, where's MPI, MPI happening by selecting it. And then we see the distribution of the MPI time. So we see basically it's happening here, 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 and here. Yeah, but as I said, not much. And the OpenMP overhead is also like a little bit here and here and here. Yeah. But we can go further. MPI, uh, we can open up in, in management, which is basically uh, init and finalize. 
MPI synchronization functions, communication functions, uh, file I/O functions, and so on. Yeah, and the same for OpenMP. So as I said, we we create a hierarchy here, and by by selecting the, the hierarchy, like communication here splits up into point-to-point, -point collective, one-sided. Yeah, so I by selecting here, I can see how these things are distributed. Yeah, by by just looking at MPI, I see how all MPI functions are distributed over my, my call tree. If I'm going down to point to point, I can find all the point to point uh, functions and I see again where they're happening and to which to which portions. Yeah. So like all the point to point functions are to in this update halo functions, it's basically yeah, this uh, in this here MPI I just send and I receives all happening here and um, and then here and here, yeah. So we, we can quickly find these things, and by by looking at that, uh, we can see how it's distributed, yeah. And and so this space gives us basically about the whole program. If for specific functions like the computation, yeah, like the computation happening here in this function, we want to see how it is distributed over my machine. I can see how. Uh, yeah, how regular or unregular with, with, with load distribution is. And so by, by picking out the right metrics, see the distribution, seeing the distribution, I this program kind of allows me to, like Cube allows me to look at all the different aspects of the, the profile data and, and, and find many, many interesting uh, uh, information to hopefully allows me to, to uh, uh, optimize my program. Um, switching back to the uh, my slides presentation. So again, if you want to know more about Cube, uh, there is also an extended uh, a slide set here from the tuning workshop, which basically which has screen dumps and explanations uh, of all the things I just uh, told you, and and it shows you slide by slide. If you basically want to follow it around, you can look, of course, look at the user guide. Um, there's also uh, a guide if you want to uh, calculate additional derived metrics uh, beyond which we are providing. And then there's another thing with uh, helper tools, which I said, which manipulate the, the cube files in, in various ways. And, and we have many of them, and I just want to point out a few of them. So uh, there's a cube diff which is useful. So you have like a measurement before and after, or you want to compare algorithm A and algorithm B. And then basically what it does, it takes these two cube files uh, and, and in, in basically every value in this, in this three-dimensional structure, it, it, it does a, a difference uh, uh, operation and you get a, a new uh, cube file out where basically now in, in every location, um, the difference is, and so basically when you browse this one, it allows you now, and now the values go from minus to plus, and basically plus means it, it got better and minus it got worse. So now you can explore by looking at this diff file by basically what things got better and which got, got worse in, in, and 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 to what uh, amount and did basically my pro did everyone get better or did, did my problem just move and so on. Yeah, um, cube merge allows you to do like have multiple uh, measurements um, and combine them. So this is sometimes useful if you want to do lots of hardware counter measurements, but in, in, in a single run, you can only like collect four hardware counters. So you could do multiple runs with different hardware counter sets, merge them together, and then you would have in one in one file basically all the data from all the measurements with all the the, the uh, uh, hardware counters, uh, for example. Uh, with cube derive allows you to uh, uh, basically uh, define a, your own uh, derived metrics and add it to the file. You can also do it through a GUI, but there's also a tool, uh, tool to kind of do it uh, outside uh, uh, on the command line. Um, then cube cut allows you to uh, concentrate on, on portions of it. Say like you make a larger measurement, and there's lots of uh, uh, whatever uh, post and pre-processing in there, which is uh, uninteresting. So you say, I, I just want to basically look at uh, 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 like the main iteration. So if it's in a separate tree, you can kind of cut that out and generate a, a new profile, which basically just contains this 
with subtree and then basically like the 100 percent uh, is is basically now just that tree and you can kind of ignore this way the, the post and pre-processing or you can cut out uh, a subtree from uh, a measurement and so on if you want to do uh, more command line and automatic analysis we also have additional tools uh, like a whole variety like the two interesting ones is kubestat it gives you like basic statistics like top 10 functions executed and stuff like that and with kube dump it allows you in a kind of a command line way to extract data out of the cube which you want to basically either like feed into knu plot or get a, a csv file out so you can put it in a spreadsheet um, if, if it's uh, installed with R and, and uh, done, it, you can also um, export R matrices to, to look at the stuff in R and so on. So that, that could be kind of uh, useful um, and so on. Okay, that was basically what I was I wanted to present. Um, uh, you find uh, everything about Skalaska and Cube on our website, skalaska.org. Uh, if you have questions about it, you can send them to skalaska.fzulik.de. Uh, Scorpi, as I told you, is uh, uh, everything you find on scorpi.org. And there's also a help kind of email where you can send your questions to support at uh, scorpi.org. <laughs>